i w Samsunga, po wszelkiej innowacji z Amazona. Mieliśmy również spotkanie z szefem innowacji Wall Street Journal, to jest bardzo ciekawe. Dzisiaj gościmy szefa innowacji w Cisco. Zaczynajmy. Ok, so guys, Filip, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bartek. Thank you, Paweł. Congratulations for your in initiative, We Innovators Club. Uh, it, it's a very strong uh, project, so it's my great pleasure today uh, to moderate this fascinating talk. Uh, my name is Filip Dybowski. Um, I'm responsible for Trend House, which is Innovation Ecosystem Clubhouse in the Innovation Campus uh, for CEE in Warsaw, Poland. Um, run by Venture Cafe Warsaw Foundation and also the, the Innovation Campus is built by Cambridge Innovation Center uh, from Boston. Um, our today guest is Alex Goryachev. Uh, I'm super happy, Alex, to meet you today, uh, virtually, maybe after pandemic in person. Um, the truth is, Alex is a true celebrity in the world of innovation. Uh, his resume reads like a brief history of tech disruption. Um, and apart from, from your role, role in Cisco, you are also uh, a well-seasoned entrepreneur from Silicon Valley, uh, but a very pragmatic and, and successful one. Uh, today we will talking, uh, we'll be talking about building the next normal, fearless innovation. Uh, so basically our world is forever changed. Uh, innovation is the bridge to overcome some of the greatest challenges that we are facing together. And in my humble opinion, each crisis accelerates historical processes. So the question is how to embrace unstable world and turn crisis into a positive change. Uh, my great authority and my friend, Professor Poszajski, he said that business today is about creation. Creation is rebellion and rebellion is an art. So the questions for today are how and why should we count on innovation rebels? Uh, why should we look towards the next normal, how to survive and thrive in the next normal, and how to question status quo and truly welcome and care about innovation, not just celebrate innovation. These are your words, uh, Alex, from your brief about this speech. Uh, so together today we will explore trends and be best practices to enable pragmatic innovation in your, uh, in terms of attendees uh, organization. So prepare for a power keynote and give maybe a silent a virtual bravo for Alex for the start of your speech. Uh, after the, the speech, we'll have a Q&A session, so uh, be prepared to, uh, to ask some uh, juicy uh, words to our guest, Alex. So Alex, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I assume you can hear me well and can see me well, right? Yeah. Can you guys hear? Yeah, fine. perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so again, thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me, especially, and thank you for for organizing this uh, Innovators Club, because when I think about uh, when I think about innovation, right, uh, it's be, it's a support system, and um, I really like the this expression that uh, innovation it requires rebellion, right, and in 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 many cases it does because it's it's all it's almost always going against the um, against the system, and I think. When you're in the, in the, in a large organization, it takes uh, it takes an effort to go and and build it. And I was really privileged to to help build um, you know some of our innovation programs at Cisco, and and help establish them, and then um, help others take them to the to the next level. So what I wanted to do very briefly is kind of just set the context for um, for the discussion. Talk a bit about uh, the the next normal or whatever that could be spend a few minutes on on how Cisco innovates because I think it'll, it nicely talks of, it fits this in a, in an ecosystem concept and then I'll uh, I'll um, I'll circle back for Q&A and discussion uh, how does that sound all right um, yeah, I think it's perfect yeah mm -hmm. thank you so I mean here's the thing I mean personally I, I have a problem with the slide because I do believe innovation is a buzzword and it's it's kind of a horrible buzzword because we keep hearing what innovation is and and not many people frankly know what it is or um, but they you know they keep saying be innovative or let's be innovative we're the most innovative but really if you look pragmatically in a, in a large company or in a, in an, in many entities people really don't know what it is and or not necessarily have faith um, in innovation. 
I think what's unique about today, and I think there's this expression somewhere, never waste a good crisis, right? Um, is the fact that everyone is innovating, right? I, you know, I'm speaking from my bedroom actually, um, because my son, Matthew, who is in first grade, is, is studying in my office and he is innovating with his teachers because he has first grade in virtual school. And, um, and I'm sure each one of you as a, as, a, as a student, as a parent, as an individual, as a citizen, small business owner, we're all innovating. So, so for the first time, nobody can deny that innovation is all around us. That's just simple. So, so if we think about the stages of the innovation, it's very unfortunate that we're in this COVID-19 thing. And um, when we think about kind of the, the, the stages of going through this, I think we're past stage one. And then stage one was really about responding. There is a crisis. We, need, we must respond immediately. What is our emergency response? We, we implemented social distancing. By the way, I, I, I really think it's, um, it's actually a horrible work too because it should be physical distancing. Socially, I think we are um, closer than ever. At least I know what the, like how the homes of all of my coworkers look and I met their children. So socially, I think we, we're, we're a bit closer, but physically we're distant. And then obviously, here we are today talking electronically and most of our businesses engaged electronically. So that's kind of the first phase. I think we're past this. And now in retrospect, I think this is what's gonna be the most uh, important phase. It's a phase of reflection. What happened and how are we gonna work going forward? How are we going to retain our institutional knowledge when we don't necessarily sit in the same classroom or office or um, our families are separated for some unfortunate reason? And then if we're an enterprise, how do we make sure that we stabilize supply chain? And I think all of us know that from, from food to certain industrial goods, it's, it's hard to, to find certain objects. But I think the most important part of that reflection is really, we're learning so much we're challenging ourselves. We are, we're questioning, do we need to go to the office every day? Is it 40 hour work week? Is school worth it? Do I need to go to college? Um, is this certain technology worth it? So there are a lot of things where we're questioning our work values and I think personal values. And I feel it's very important that we really capture this. So whenever we go back to that next normal, and or just look at how we want to live each day whenever we're people or you know we're all people but in whatever our roles are we really leverage whatever we reflected and challenge going back to that rebellion the norms that existed before and and and, and change processes and change the world for the better which is that third third phase about reimagining what is that new normal how do we take those learning from from reflection and then what are the risks we're willing to, um, to, to take? And some of them will fail, but let's just agree that uh, we probably should rebuild a lot of things that we've observed. And once we start rebuilding that, obviously there will be a future rebound and there will be a, a growth. And that growth will only be based on that new thinking, on the new models that we will implement, on the fact that we will be agile and agility takes discipline. It's just it, agility is not an excuse for chaos. It's really a, uh, it's really a way of thinking where we are able to go and quickly adapt. Um, and then, and then obviously building digital capabilities. So I think kind of that's that's where we are. And in the past, I think people were not necessarily convinced on the value of innovation or on the on the fact that there could be disruption. A lot of businesses were kind of saying, let's go disrupt something. I'm not sure why, but not a lot of businesses were prepared for disruption, right? And I know Blockbuster is, is a very overused um, example, uh, but it's still, it's, still a, it's still a great example. And I think the companies that are going to miss the transition and miss that framework and not take the values uh, and reflections are unfortunately are gonna join this list. So 
the need for innovation, I think, and the value case for innovation uh, right now is exists like never before. So if I think about some takeaways from this, it's obviously paying attention to whatever is going on in the world. It's not only looking, uh, you know, not having a tunnel vision. Let's let's look uh, let's look around us and 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 learn. Um, always look at implications for your organization. One thing many years ago, I worked on business continuity planning. What happens if there's a disaster? What happens if there's a strike? What happens if something happens? And I really, I never thought people would take this seriously. And I think many people were not taking this seriously. I was probably not taking this seriously enough, but it's actually very important to that, to always be curious and, and have the urgency and kind of push yourself out of the comfort zone. And I think all of us did, right? And if we look at how we approach that, I think it's really about strategy and focus. And that focus on strategy should be something that's clear, measurable. We'll talk about that in a minute and something that everybody can understand. Uh, and when I say everybody, it's all employees, all members of the organization. And I think having that common understanding of what that is, 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 is very important. And I think many of you are familiar with a um, Maslow hierarchy of needs. And I think right now, again, going back to that rebellion and a crisis and, and, and the opportunity, for the first time, we are innovating across all of those dimensions at the same time, right? Because if we think about, if we believe in this theory as, um, um, you know, as humans, we first, we take care of our, you know, physiological needs and safety and belongings, and then we kind of self-actualize. And when we think about the innovation right now, innovation at all levels, it's about survival. Whenever you're a multinational company or, uh, or a small restaurant on a corner, it, because we must change and, and we must change quickly. And then as we change and as we survive, we have capacity to operationalize, be more efficient. That's what organizations are about and hopefully what they're about. And then use that efficiency to grow and help others. And I think that, again, we, no matter if you're a nonprofit or a government organization or, or, or a business, big or small, I think this expression that all of us together, when it comes to innovation, uh, is so true. Because we kind of, we just, look, we want to be safe and we want to hug each other and we, and we want to, and each one of us wants to contribute to this. So I really feel that innovation right now has that purpose and every person pro understands that. And the reason I talk about people is I think we, all, we, we often get stuck on a technology or innovation. What is, in, what is the innovation? I'd argue that the innovation is um, is not as important as innovators. It's really not about what is created, but it's rather who is create uh, who is creating it and how people are communicating. And um, the reason I think the the proof point here is, I mean, many of you come from a venture world or lived uh, and worked with a venture world, but if you go to a venture capital firm. They probably heard all ideas in the world, or let's just say many of them. And after hearing the idea, the most important question that they will ask is who is on your team, right? And if you look at venture funds, they typically, of course, they fund ideas, but they fund teams and people behind the ideas. So in your organization, creating that uh, creating that connection between the innovators and having and having them uh, understand the clear goal and purpose is essential and that's why i'm so grateful that organizations like this one they exist because it really enables you know me to share something and then listen to you and learn from you and it gives an opportunity to all of us to do that so a few takeaways is Talk to the people in your organization. They know what's working or what's not working. And I think that's that's essential. Um, 
innovation requires transparency. So if you're working uh, with innovation projects or you're trying to change, I think being honest with each other about what the goals and metrics, and we'll talk about metrics in a minute, is essential. Um, having a pragmatic vision is, um, is important. Look, there is nothing wrong with chasing a billion dollar idea, but how about we make a million dollar idea work first, right? So step-by-step -step strategy that is socialized and that's pragmatic, I think is essential. And then, and then being accountable for that. Again, it's very easy to say, let's think disruptively. I'm not sure how that's pragmatic or what accountability comes with it, but if we're gonna say, Let's increase customer satisfaction through innovation by X percent. Someone will be uh, will be accountable, which really, you know, drops me into the uh, the metrics bucket. And I'm a big fan of metrics. My kind of my background was uh, in metrics and analytics and data. And I truly believe and I hope many I hope to convince some of you, if you don't believe in this, that innovation must be measured. And the most importantly, I would want to say that it needs to begin with a, with a metric in mind. It's right. Why are we innovating? For what purpose? Because when we're doing, a, when we're working in a, in a large company or a small company, uh, we have company goals. So how are we meeting company goals for innovation? And this is where I feel it's very important we separate activity from impact. Uh, and like the one thing I want to say is innovation is not measured in the innovation awards, nor is it measured in hackathons or other things. These are more of an activity metrics. Um, so it's really about engaging in something. I think it's important that we actually look very pragmatically into what is it that we want to impact through innovation. Because the hackathon or a patent or trained employee has a purpose, and that purpose could be revenue growth or savings or brand value or employee experience, whatever those clear measurable things are, I think focusing on them first is essential. And I do want to highlight operational savings, right? Because um, a lot of great innovations, especially if we look around, they're not necessarily about only new technology it's about applying a new process and sometimes just the process innovation is so important and that's why i go back to that culture because in the organizations i think all of us know what's wrong and what's not working and if we are empowered to be open and transparent about it and change it that's when the i think the real innovation happens so beginning and having that clear metric for every or, for every organization or for your company or no matter what what function you're in it really grounds us pragmatically and helps us uh, go and execute towards that goal and i think the best example of that pragmatic thinking is the real question that allows us to look at things holistically is not can it be built i really think everything can be built but it really about should it be built and then it really puts us pragmatically kind of from invention to innovation and then and thinks about the customer and how this is going to impact uh, lives. How is it going to create revenue? How it's going to change the process? But then it really puts things in a real life environment. So that, uh, that is, I think, uh, if you want to look at the innovation metric, that is a good one to ask first. Um, and uh, and find those balanced measurements that are right. Um, and of course, activity is very important. But why we're having that activity and capturing those impact metrics, I think essential. Communicating the metrics and ensuring that people are accountable for it and we actually publish performance, I think is very essential because in order for innovation to really work, we have to pivot very fast. And when data is in the open and everybody sees that something is not working and you can't hide it, then we're gonna take, uh, then we're gonna make change, right? So of course, innovation takes time. There's no question about it, but we still need to measure it 
and see if that time, because time is money, it's, you know, time is limited in our lives. Um, is this a good investment? And I, and again, I think metrics uh, play, play a key role. And then the last thing I think really goes to the essence of uh, where we are today and the ecosystems. Innovation loves company. It's, it's so true. It doesn't really happen in the four walls of the enterprise. It only happens when people of different backgrounds come together and when they communicate. Why is Silicon Valley so successful? I think it's not really about the, the you know the wine or the weather, um, and not everybody likes sunshine uh, uh, or California wine. It's really about um, it's really about the fact that people from different backgrounds come together and they talk to each other, and um, that's why it it indeed can be recreated uh, in so many environments. Really, it's really about culture, and that culture can be built and incentivized. So if I think about Cisco and how we build that culture of innovation, we look at innovation in, in several pillars. It's build, buy, partner, invest, and co-develop. And um, what I'm gonna do is uh, quickly walk you through these and then we'll, we'll take time um, for discussion and questions. And, uh, but first it's, it's obviously building the technology, right? So there's, uh, um, over 25,000 engineers that are building technology of today and technology of tomorrow. We spend about $7 billion uh, on R&D. We have opportunities for, uh, for em employees internally to create startups and not only pitch their ideas for somebody else to decide if they're good or bad, but to actually pitch them to, um, to other employees or to get practical funding inside the company to go and build that technology or change that process which i think that uh, that is very is very important cisco does acquire a lot of companies and um so there's over 210 acquisitions some of them are billion dollar acquisitions some of them are million dollar acquisition i think what really unique about this is that it 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 constantly brings new thinking into the work into the workforce and I think that's essential because there are people that join Cisco and they challenge Cisco because they have different standards, they have different beliefs, they have different ways of doing things. And uh, some of those things are better than the things that exist today. And I think what I appreciate about Cisco's and its acquisition integration and the way it works with others is it really listens to uh, you know to the companies that we acquire. It listens to the employees, and then every time a new company joins Cisco for an acquisition, there's just a far better culture, right? And um, and that we do create something called the Founders Forum, which is an opportunity for the officers and executives of the companies that we buy uh, to go and kind of advise Cisco and work on a high-profile projects. So I think that's uh, that's essential. Um, we obviously partner with others uh, because everything is kind of everything is achievable through partnerships. And it's not only the examples like Google's and others. It's not only about like how Cisco's technology, uh, how, for example, Apple technology works better with Cisco, but it's 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 partnering with businesses that are um, big or small. Um, because when you work with, for example, with channels or or partners, they have the expertise and knowledge that a large company would not, right? Because they're focused on a particular vertical or geography. So it's, I think when we talk about co-innovation and the ecosystem, it's not only your employees, it's not only the companies you buy, but, uh, and the customers, but really people that integrate your products, that sell your products, no matter what industry you're in, they, they know things that, that, uh, people in headquarters don't, and listening to them is essential. And then, you know, the one pillar, before I jump to uh, to co-develop, actually, the other pillar that I want to uh, mention is investment. Um, Cisco does invest in, in many companies, um, and we not only invest and work with startups, but we invest in startup accelerators which really provides us an opportunity to go and, and, and work with them. Like for example, Startup Bootcamp that we did in, in, um, in Europe. And um, 
one of the things that I uh, helped uh, build at Cisco and uh, is uh, the innovation centers where we work with our employees and and uh, um, and uh, with startups and, and academia, really trying to bring a lot of them together. So we've built that around the world. And uh, uh, that's something that uh, Cisco is now taking uh, taking to another level under engineering leadership. So we, we've built a really good solid foundation that allows us to engage with all. Um, and when I think about kind of that model, this allows this innovation strategy and this thinking is really see around corners, not only be focused on one thing, but or one technology or one geography. Um, it really invests in people and their ideas. And I think we talked about the fact that it's really, it's really about who versus what. And then we keep innovating. And that I think that is uh that is an essential um, that is an essential part, and we keep innovating by by getting more data, by by challenging ourselves, and by by listening to others, uh, no matter if these are big customers or 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 small startups. So, I think the takeaways from here is, again, whenever you're a small organization or large, having that balanced strategy is the key. Uh, partnership with companies, large or small, is essential. Um, co-innovating with customers and employees, and sometimes even with competition, right? Cities, academia, it's all about creating that ecosystem. It's not about having a bigger slice of the pie. It's about making a pie bigger uh, and, and something that really serves a, serves a bigger a bigger purpose. Uh, so I'd, I'd highly encourage you uh, to look at this. And uh, because at the end of the day, I really want to highlight that innovation is not, it's not an engineering or IT or services or marketing. It really belongs to all. It's in us as a citizens, as human beings. And I think right now is absolutely uh, the most perfect time to innovate. And we must innovate to, to change the world. And I think no one will argue that we need to change the world. Uh, and right now is the best time to do that. I'll turn this back to you. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you for this tremendous speech. Uh, I, I'm thrilled. It was really a lot of good content here, a lot of good points. I can also see um, from our attendees that they are um, inspired by your speech because we have a lot of questions right now. Um, so the first one comes from Małgorzata Sobol. Thanks you, Małgorzata, for your uh, point of view. And it also, it also connects um, to the idea which I've heard recently from the Deutsche Telekom. Um, this means that um, basically we should rather focus on um, core innovation and long shots and disruptive innovation is much harder in the time of crisis. And the question from Małgorza, Małgorzata says, um, do you assume that the COVID-19 crisis enables us to predict the social changes to plan to project ETC? Isn't the case that any huge crisis is always one step ahead and as a matter of fact, simply we are not able to react on due time. Any talks about innovation are rather a futurology and not business pragmatic or scientific planning. It's a different point of view, but we are super curious. Um, uh, how would you, would you respond to this question? Uh, so I think, first of all, excellent question, and and it's it's very deep on so on so many levels. Um, I think uh, there's a couple of things. I, I think the future is as essential as core. Um, I think it's a, it's it's really it's really key, and what unites them is the process. So I think it's important that we focus on the process. Because when we look at, um, because we look often in a crisis, we rearrange the existing pieces. And in order to rearrange the existing pieces and quickly, quickly evolve, this is all, in many cases, this is all about process, right? Um, so I think being open to that process is, is, is essential. I think there's as much money in, in process as in technology. And frankly, we don't have the process. The technology is, uh, is not is not always um, useful, and then if I think about, I think more of a futuristic question. I mean, I think yeah, right now is uh, 
um, can we predict uh, kind of the social changes of the crisis? Uh, yes, I mean, because we can we can definitely predict that people care more about fitness. They care more about health care. They care more about, uh, you know, school system. So there's those care abouts uh, that will definitely drive social change. It's about having equal access to the Internet. For example, in the past, um, OK, you may not have a high speed connection at your house. So you go to a coffee shop. But what happens when the coffee shop is is um, is closed? How are your kids going to school? Are you able to do your work remotely? So I think there's a lot of questions of equity, um, uh, equality, and just kind of inclusion that comes in, and that will drive change. And I think that will, uh, that change will will kind of create us, will get us to the next level, and will start solving other problems. Just like at, at we um, maybe an optimist. I'm an optimist, but if we go um, and look at history, we become I think more responsible in society and 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 better as human beings because we, I think we care more about others and um, that's that's kind of what my answer is. Yeah, yeah, I strongly agree with you, Alex. Um, I think that you know the time will show uh, who is rebellious and who is fearless, as in your book, you know. So companies who are not so afraid of the crisis but still will put some effort in the proper pragmatic innovation will win in the long run after the. The crisis. Uh, you show this Maslow uh, pyramid, uh, and I believe you know it also shows that on different levels. Now we have, uh, ironically, the golden times for innovation, mm -hmm. but for the proper innovation. Uh, and we, if someone was a bad leader um, before the crisis, uh, he or she will become even worse leader in the pandemics because pandemics accelerates all the processes and systems. Uh, and this um, heads us towards the second question. What is the proper skill set uh, of a leader uh, in terms of innovation, in terms of the crisis? And also the question from Tomasz Chmal. Uh, Thank you, Tomasz. How teamwork and team involvement uh, sh should work in the, in the innovation ecosystem? And how can we measure uh, innovation um, in terms of, of team, of teamwork and, and collective uh, involvement? Thank you. These are great questions. And uh, Philip, thank you for bringing up the, the pyramid. Uh, I, I really think it's a golden age. And uh, Thomas, thank you for, for your question, because I think they're, they're very connected. At Cisco, we have, um, we have this uh, expression, which, is, uh, which I feel is great, which is uh, give your ego a day off. So when we think about innovation, the leaders that are primarily about innovation space, it really, I think that's um, uh, having less ego um, and having and being more of a facilitator of other people's ideas and listener. I think that is in the um, that is an essential skill. That doesn't that we shouldn't say that a visionary. Can, that's that's not to say we shouldn't have visionaries, but when we have visionaries that are pragmatic that have a less attitude and less ego and are willing to listen and accept other people's ideas and opinions, these are the best leaders. And specifically, when we think about the teamwork, it really, I think it really comes down to several things. The first thing is innovation requires vulnerability and emotional safety. Because in order for us to go and share something with others and work with each other, we have to feel free and not threatened to just share what we think. And because there are no wrong ideas, okay, there might be wrong ideas, but we shouldn't be uh, fearful of expressing them. Um, so that, that trust and vulnerability and openness is the key in the team environment. But the second thing that I would challenge is, I think it's essential that we look at who is on that team. And because the diversity of thoughts comes from a diversity of experience. So it's essential that you're, when you're working on any change, you have representatives from different functions, much like when you're a local restaurant, I'm simplifying this, you're working with your customers and suppliers because you're on this together and a landlord. So if you're in no organization, it's not only about having engineers innovate, it's, all, it's having a marketing people and the business people and accountants and everybody else together because otherwise you are not solving a problem 
or you're creating a product that's not shippable or a process that doesn't scale. Yeah, um, Harvard Business Review recently wrote about something called empathetic leadership uh, as as a cure for for tough times, and I I think it perfectly fits what you what you just said. And also, this empathetic leadership consists of a few elements. One of them is resigning on purpose from your hierarchy um, permits, uh, so you can um, distribute your ego to your employees and also listen before taking action. So it, it was also in your speech that we should rather uh, gather feedback uh, from rebels and whistleblowers and then create innovation, right? Uh, and it also, it also connects with um, the next question from Halina. Um, Halina Brudlak, thank you for, for this question. Um, what about people's well-being with a good quality of life? Does pandemic correct a little bit of thinking in terms of finance as measure of innovation. So how about putting well-being and um, um, also um, proper mental health and physical health before uh, profits in, in KPIs? I think, uh, I think that's an essential, I think that's an essential question. And that's such a great question because we should not, you know, the results of, uh... actually, let me, let me backtrack. I think, I think that's exactly what's happening. And I think that's exactly what will happen because if we, uh, because at least I, I'm gonna speak for me, right? Um, I look at who am I as a father? Who am I as a husband? What's important for my family? What is the best thing to do? And God forbids, what happens if I'm not around tomorrow or somebody gets, gets sick or if I can't see my parents? Of course, you know, we, our life on this planet is, is unfortunately, so far is limited. Uh, uh, but those questions, I, I haven't asked them before, right? So I think that when we talk about just this basic questioning of why we're here and what is our purpose, is I think is, is going on with most of the people I know. I'm sure it's going on with every single one of you. And... Um, when we look at the organizations, they're consisting of people. So if we go and we bring that attitude to work, and when we go or bring we, that attitude to school or to our loved ones, and we look at where we wanna apply ourselves and how, how do we love each other better? And how do we create more purpose? And how do we create more impact in our lives? things will change and i think they will change already because everybody that i talk to if you if you really have a deep conversation with them it really comes back to why am i here and how do i help others and yeah going back to that uh, hierarchy of needs i think most of the employees understand that and the companies understand that and that's why we're seeing such an unprecedented response and and help i think in every industry Mm -hmm. I think it's super important what, what you've just said. So I will just quickly grab it because it's, it's a pretty important remark. Uh, so companies nowadays should put purpose over profit to win, to win in the long run, not only to save uh, our world, but also to win in terms of uh, uh, cooperating or competing with other corporations. Um, and um, I think that there is no middle ground. So either you are in world saving business or you're in the world destroying business, yeah? It's not, it's not gray nowadays. Your business must somehow uh, help employees or, or, or our world, yeah, in, in terms of innovation. Yeah, I think it's about, really, it's about shared values, right? I, and I wouldn't say, I mean, it's hard for me to say purpose over, over profit, right? Because there's different corporate structures. Uh, there is, uh, you know, legally at certain point, in certain corporations, you have to, apply certain things. So there are nonprofits, there are other corporations. The one interesting movement that is happening around the world, and I, I discovered um, it recently, are the B corporations. And it, it's a pretty unique thing. If you, if you just Google it, or if you read up more about them, that, these are the corporations that say, we have shared values with our communities. And yes, profit is as important than as other things. And we will never put it above you know, reasonable supply chain, um, proper values, treating employees right, 
And that's a very interesting structure. And personally, as a consumer, I tend to buy from B corporations because I know that they behave in a way that I, as a human being, value. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, as our attendees um, say, uh, innovation is not everything. And uh, as Mag Magda Brill, thank you, Magda, for your point of view, uh, written, not every company wants and needs to be innovative. Yeah, it's not always necessary. So, how can we measure culture, uh, culture, or, or, or level of innovation in organizations? You know, I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to come up with an example of a company that does not to be innovative. I and I'd love to learn one because I'm. Yeah, you know, people even in a, in a monopoly in, in terms of like oil and gas, right? Uh, well, all the, you get disruption from solar or, or other things. But if you're creating a table, you also need to be innovative at some point. Well, you need to, well, here's the thing. I mean, I, I really think uh, respectfully that you must be innovative because a more more innovative company will put you out of business. Uh, so mm -hmm. you don't have to be, but you're not going to be around for for some time. But but I think that the later part of that statement is essential because what really makes the company innovative is that culture. So so the second, how do you measure the culture? I think if you measure the culture in terms of people being open to new ideas, about people being transparent, about sharing sharing their values, and knowing about. Um, goals of the company i think that's that that will automatically feed innovation it will happen because mm -hmm. i mean you go in a, in some enterprises and respectfully you say hey what does our company do and unless you're in sales some people don't even know or you say who are our competitors right what are our biggest problems and people don't know so i think awareness of purpose goals mm -hmm. challenges metrics and then an opportunity for every employee to go and contribute across all of those levels that's what um that's what creates a great culture and i think that um you may you can measure it in so many ways there could be a great places to work like uh for example cisco is uh it could be just about you know people employer retention it's about how many people want to go work for your company uh, it could be employee satisfaction. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, that that is the environment that's going to create most value for mm -hmm. the company stakeholders. Maciek, whenever that's, Maciek, yeah. Maciek says right now that uh, maybe innovation is also adaptation to changing env environment, but proactive, not reactive. What do you think about this? I completely agree. You know, there's this mm -hmm. thing, I mean, a lot of people say, let's think disruptively or let's disrupt this. And I'm, I'm like, unless you're in disruption business and I'm not sure what that is, it's really adaptation. In fact, uh, I think innovation is another word for evolution, but sometimes evolution happens fast or do, you know, it then becomes a technological revolution, but so it's maybe, really maybe about- Selection also, also happens in innovation, yeah? Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's really, it just happens no matter what. It's paying attention to it. And to that point, adapting quickly and seeing what the opportunity is um, for across multiple dimensions is what makes companies innovative. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's brilliant. Um, another uh, inspiring point of view from Carolina, um, she says, you said something important, Alex, right? To create uh, innovations, it's crucial to inspire and cooperate with partners, organizations. So what should we uh, do and how to think beyond different limitations resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, from your perspective, how to deal with these uh, challenges in terms of cooperation with partners, organizations and other stakeholders? I think maybe we go back to, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. I, I think there's question of how and where. Um, and I think how is really digitally that um, that is today, that is mostly the only answer. And some things are 
possible digitally. Some things are not, but I think it's it's worth um, it's worth trying. I think, in a way, it's a it's a it's a disruption that allows you to to meet more people through different means and then get to know more about them. And and the second one is where. So. I would say, and it really depends on the size of your organization, but I think that being able to to go and help the community with a particular pro I mean, I'd say start with your city or start at some, um, you know, think there's this expression that I love, which is uh, think globally, act locally. So it's really about, hey, I care there's unemployment I, where I live. How do I help? And you can you can go and help and engage with startups because startups create jobs, they create opportunities, they create tax revenue. I mean, they create so many different things that will help the city. So that's a great example of just of volunteering and and helping, getting engaged with your um, with your um, accelerator local local startup community would be would be a great one. There's tons of students that are not able to go and and have internships. One of the things that we did are virtual internships. Maybe that's something that's worth exploring or being that student that says, hey, I'm going to intern virtually. Um, these are important things. I think if we look at uh, a lot of our nonprofit entities, they're dependent on uh, on volunteers showing up. So there are a lot of food banks. One of the problems we have in California, there's so many people that are hungry. They don't have jobs. There's plenty of uh, food in the food banks. But supply chain is not moving because it requires people to show up there. So how about we we you work with others and think about new solutions to these problems? And that's frankly where the disruption happens, and it could happen yeah. through a better process. I know it's been a long answer, but I, but I, but I think it, it's a great question. It's the yeah. one I think about every day. How do I help? And actually, it connects to a great uh, Polish book, Collaborative uh, Society by Alexandra okay. Przegalska. Uh, it, it's a very, it, it's exactly what what you've just said that we should count on uh, empowering digital and physical tribes, um, especially local, to be successful in global. And I think it's also a, a very very important um, note to remember after this speech today. Um, and why we are talking still about COVID nineteen pandemics? Another question related to this topic from Tadeusz Buczko, Baczko, sorry. Uh, thank you, Tadeusz. Um, what are the new changes in measurement uh, which are related to, to the pandemia innovation? So do you, do you observe, Alex, any new KPIs, new forms of KPIs, you know, um, apart from the ones we, we've just discussed before, including well-being and, uh, and other stuff? Yeah, definitely. First of all, thank you. I found the book. I'll definitely, I'll, I'll definitely read this because we talked about culture of openness and collaboration in the companies in order enabling innovation. It's the same, it's, and I think about that just, uh, I think about that a lot, just kind of how I grew up. And I really, what separates countries that are successful, um, but it's, let's not go into how you define success for a country, right? But when we connect innovation, it really about collaboration across all levels of, uh, of people, right? It's about civic society. It's about openness. It's about, it's the same in, in, in companies. So it's a, I love this topic. Um, and, um, and so and you're absolutely civil, right. Civil media, not social media, yeah. but civil media. Absolutely. So smaller group based on trust and transparency, right? Yeah, it's it starts with you and your neighbor, right? And and uh, absolutely. And um, but if I go back to the to the metric, so thank you for the book. If I go back to the metric. I think the one metric that is very close to my heart is really about uh, digital inclusion. And here's what I mean by that. Um, there's less, there's slightly, slightly more than half of the population of the world that is connected to the internet. There are places on this planet and, and there are a lot of the places where there is no coverage. And there, or there is no high-speed internet, or there's simply no internet access, which right now means that kids are not going to school, somebody is not getting medical care, and you have no opportunity to work or look for work or be that virtual intern. So for me, you know, it's really, it's really ensuring that that connectivity exists. And then using it for something, uh, you know, for something better, I think that is the metric. 
because in the past we used the internet for shopping, music, and entertainment. We used it for far more than that, but that was a primary use case. And we, first it was a luxury that was a necessity. Right now it's the question of fairness and equal access. And I think that is an essential metric in the community. I'm glad that you that you said that um, about about your, your fairness also in in the innovation, uh, but I observe you know that still some corporations are just doing you know this kind of PR innovation. Uh, I call it PowerPoint kar karaoke, um, uh, and I'm super happy that Cisco does it in a proper, pragmatic, and super valuable way, which I observed uh, also in the past working with Cisco for for at some point. Um, so so Tam ups for you but unfortunately some corporations um, understand innovation like let's paint a room in orange put a ping pong table and then creative innovation happens you know and so Rafa Omrówka asked a, a, a super important question uh, when do you think about your experiences in creating innovation culture what types of mistakes could you remember maybe uh, maybe an uh, surprising not intuitive mistakes uh, in your mind yeah, I actually, first of all, thank you so much for, for the ping pong and everything else. There must be a kombucha on top and, you know, yeah. beer in the fridge and all the other things. And I actually, I actually have a, by the way, I think those places are important as long as everybody has access there. And I think one of the mistakes that I can remember is I actually, going back to that room, I created, and giving your ego a day off, I actually created that room. And but I created it for everybody. But somehow I felt that I was the one who needed to decide what color this is. I was the one, and my team, I admit, was the perfect one to create. We know what that innovation environment should be. We built our room, nobody came there. People hated it, right? And uh, and that was a mistake. So we corrected it. We took that budget and we came back to the community and basically of employees said, hey, here's the money that we would allocate to that room. How would you want to go and spend and what kind of environment that you want to create? And that goes basically, again, you're giving your ego a day off, which I should have done from a get-go. You're empowering others and you are empowering people to collaborate because they need to communicate honestly and openly about what they want to create. Um, I don't remember. I think at the end they decided we don't need the room, right? We want to do something else. But I think that's that's the key. Not deciding for others is is uh, and sometimes deciding for others is is the mistake that I've made in, in that very particular example. Thanks, thanks, Alex. Uh, just a few last thoughts uh, from my side. Um, you you told about blockbuster case and it, it reminded me about Kodak moment and also Nokia case in, in the past. So a lot of companies failed to be present while the innovation was happening. Um, and uh, I like to use this metaphor of a train. So some corporations are in a train observing that they are faster than other trains. Uh, so they think everything is okay because they are, um, they are leading the run of trains but they don't have a window in the roof and they don't see that, that some other others are flying planes um, already. Yeah. So they are blind because they don't have cooperation with startups. They don't have hackathons. They don't have eyes and ears to check for innovation. Yeah. So the question is, what are the uh, most valuable eyes and ears for innovation right now? How uh, corporations sh should look for this innovation? Should it be only internal or rather focusing on, on hackathons and, and startups and still um, trying to be there in the field or, or maybe virtually. Yeah? So what are the, the trends right now? So first of all, I so appreciate the observation on a, on a, on a train. In fact, um, the one funny thing about train is if you are, if the, if your train is not moving, but the others are moving near you, you have that illusion that you're moving too, right? I think all of us like, which train is moving? Are we moving or is that the other train is moving? It, yeah, I, I yeah. haven't thought about this, but actually yeah. it's it's even more enriching, yeah, for this yeah. for this example. Yeah, and I think it's not it's not being limited by by our mind. I'll tell you just a second, a personal example. Many years ago, I worked for a coolest company on earth called Napster. 
a recruiter called me and said, hey, do you want to go work for the startup called Facebook? Uh, I heard about Facebook, small company, 150 people. I'm and I was so arrogant. I lectured that recruiter. I said, are you kidding me? There's MySpace. Have you heard about MySpace? It already exists. I don't know how many of you know about MySpace, but there was MySpace and Facebook reinvented that completely. So it's, it's not being ignorant and that's being open to possibilities. And I think the only way to do that for a large company is by working with others. And the only way to do that is by incentivizing employees to go work with others and um, being, being uh, mentoring students, working with academia, working with startups, volunteering at the local startup accelerator. Because when co corporations are, or any organization is a collection of people, it's a collection of our values. So when we're connected to others, change happens. Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, it was pretty, pretty brilliant. I think that uh, Alvin Toffler said that il illiterate uh, analphabeti of the 21st century uh, will be ones who are uh, not um, uh, unable to, to read, but ones who are unable to relearn and unlearn. So I think we should relearn and unlearn bad uh, behaviors, bad innovation models and come uh, to the fearless innovation era so thank you, Alex, uh, once again for this amazing uh, talk. I will give uh, quickly the voice to, to Bartek and, uh, and Pavel uh, to provide a quick closing uh, remarks. Thank you. Okay, Alex, thank you very much for your presentation and Philip, thank you for your uh, great uh, moderation. Uh, we are happy that uh, uh, you, you were uh, a part of uh, our We Innovators Club and uh, we are really happy that we and our attendees could uh, see the presentation. Uh, thank you and I would like to ask Pavel to say who will be next uh, in our club. Thank you very much. Unfortunately we won't see next week but I hope we will somehow uh, survive without meeting us. Um, but uh, in two weeks, however, we um, have a real surprise uh, for you. An absolutely unique person will be um, our guest. Uh, our guest, Winton Self, uh, is recognized as uh, one of the inventors of the internet and uh, is current, currently uh, vice president uh, at the Google. Uh, Maciej Kawetki will be a host of um, this webinar. And um, I'm sure that um, we have a very interesting uh, meeting ahead of us. Okay, so Alex, now um, you can go to your election uh, campaign. I hope that uh, your candidate, uh, who, whoever uh, he is, uh, will, won will win. Thank you. Thank you. you. And uh, by, the, by the way, just, uh, Philip, you're, you're onto something with that uh, Toffler quote, because I'm trying to convince my, my six-year-old to learn to write. And he's like, Dad, I can just speak to Siri and it types. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to think about that one. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alex. And if you have any leaks about the election, maybe you can tell us right now who won. <laughs> Bad connection, guys. We'll, we'll, we'll talk soon. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Well, okay. Bye. Thank bye you bye. very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Dzięki Filip. Dziękuję Trzymaj bardzo. się i do zobaczenia. Dziękuję. Dobrego wieczoru. Dziękuję. Dziękuję. Dziękujemy Państwu bardzo. Do zobaczenia.